As Aaron said, today we close out our summer series entitled Got Questions. Back in the spring, the you, the congregation, were invited to submit questions, and the sermons all summer were based on responses to those. Forest Church, the UU minister and author, I love that name, Forest Church, he wrote, in every age, religion has addressed itself to questions of life and death, of origins and destinations, of living well in order that life may be redeemed by some purpose that even death cannot dispel. Today we are addressing questions of living well. Interestingly, as I was contemplating this call to ministry, one of the things I had to come to terms with was questions. I mean, it seemed to me that ministers knew all the answers to all the questions all the time. I mean, other than what, an hour or two on Sunday mornings, they pray and meditate and read big, thick theology books in German all week. I found out that wasn't true. Some of the books are in French. No, but of course I should know some of the answers, or at least where to find them. I went to a pricey graduate school in order to prepare for this, and I only bring that up to say that was helped very much by this congregation through the Rabel Scholarship, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for that. The other thing I realized is it's the minister's job, especially you, you ministers, to help us ask better questions. We may not have the answers, but we are here in covenant and community to work with you on those answers, knowing that each one of us may come up with a slightly different answer, and I love that. So today's topic and questions revolve around the concept, what am I supposed to do with my life? Or, as poets have put it, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And what shape waits in the seed of you to grow and spread its branches against a future sky? Your questions included, am I doing the right thing? Am I serving the best way possible? Am I living as I am called to live? Am I fulfilling God's will for my life? And of course, inextricably linked to those questions, people also ask, am I happy? And what is happiness anyway? These are great questions, and I breathed a sigh of relief when I read them. I was petrified I was going to get difficult questions. <laughs> As you might suspect, we in 2017 are not the first people to ask. Almost immediately, Mud As Man sat up, looked around, and said, What is the purpose of all this? For several thousand years, philosophers and theologians have said, what is our purpose here in the universe? Aristotle, whose name means the best purpose, believed that everything in the universe not only has a purpose, but an intrinsic drive, and that these are tied up with the concept of virtue. He believed the function specific to humans was a combined activity of logos, or reason, and suke, a word typically translated as soul. Aristotle identified such peak activity of the soul as the aim of all human deliberate action and called it eudaimonia, generally translated as happiness or sometimes well-being. To have the potential of ever being happy in this way necessarily required a good character and moral virtue. He believed that happiness is an ordered and prudent life and that good habits, a sound mind, and a virtuous disposition are some of the steps 
that lead us there. And similarly, about 200 years later, the Buddha said, a disciplined mind brings happiness. Now, you could... You, you icon and supplier of quotes, Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. So, the question that one of you asked, what is happiness anyway, turns out to be a really good one. Not only because the concept of happiness is so related to meaning and purpose in our lives, but also because the concept of happiness has shifted over time. While Aristotle believed that happiness is an ordered and prudent life, by the time the Declaration of Independence declared life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as unalienable rights bestowed by our Creator, the definition had shifted to prosperity thriving, and well-being. Current usage focuses on pleasant, positive emotions in having our needs satisfied. And of course, Madison Avenue was created so we would know exactly what to purchase in order to satisfy those needs and attain happiness. Wasn't that sweet? In a recent study, psychological scientists asked nearly 400 Americans whether they thought their lives were meaningful and or happy. Examining their self-reported attitudes toward meaning, happiness, as well as many other variables, like stress levels, spending patterns, and having children, the researchers found that a meaningful life and happy life overlap in certain ways but are ultimately very different. Leading a happy life, the psychologists found, is associated with being a taker, while leading a meaningful life corresponds with being a giver. Happy people get a lot of joy from receiving benefits from others, while people leading meaningful lives get a lot of joy from giving to others. In other words, meaning transcends the self while happiness is all about giving the self what it wants. People who have high meaning in their lives are more likely to help others in need. The study participants reported deriving meaning from giving a part of themselves away to others and making a sacrifice on behalf of the overall group. They report in the meaningful life, you use your highest strengths and talents to belong to and serve something you believe is larger than yourself. I believe Emerson was warning against making happiness the goal. He knew that if one set their purpose to be useful, honorable, and compassionate, happiness would be a probable byproduct. And according to recent research, the single-minded pursuit of happiness is ironically leaving people less happy. It is the very pursuit of happiness, author Viktor Frankl wrote, that thwarts happiness. Frankl, the renowned Viennese psychiatrist, wrote the best-selling book, Man's Search for Meaning, in just nine days in 1946 about his experiences in Nazi concentration camps. In his book, Frankl concluded that the difference between those who had lived and those who had died came down to one thing, having meaning in their lives. Research has shown that having purpose and meaning in life increases overall well-being and life satisfaction, improves mental and physical health, enhances resiliency, enhances self-esteem, and decreases the chances of depression. So... No wonder you ask about happiness in the same breath as you ask about meaning. The link between happiness, meaning, and purpose is clear. You know, it occurred to me, happiness is like an ambivalent house cat, if that's not redundant. <laughs> you say its name and you hold out your arms for it to come and hug you, and it either ignores you or walks in the opposite direction. But the minute 
you try and be useful and get something done, here comes the feline of happiness and sits on your laptop. Or you're trying to read the paper and here it comes to cuddle, sits right on top of Dilbert so you can't turn the page. Now, I have been telling you, I've been citing studies, I've been giving you historical definitions as new user prone to do. I've been trying to answer your questions from up here, but I realize your questions are at least as much from here. I mean, we can all comprehend the idea that in a meaningful life we should use our highest strengths and talents to belong to and serve something we believe is higher than ourselves. We know it up here, but why do we still question in our hearts if we're doing the right thing? When I read the questions, am I doing the right thing? And am I living as I'm called to live? It led me to believe those asking the questions suspected they were not, in fact, living as they were called to or doing the right thing. And I began wondering, why are we always second-guessing ourselves about these things? And I came up with a couple of ideas. I think that we've bought into a cultural myth that tells us that everyone has a unique and special purpose in life. We will be notified of that calling in a dramatic realization early in our lives. <laughs> Once we realize it, things magically fall into place. We don't question our calling and we feel satisfied with our lives from that point on. I am sure that happens for some people, but not many. And I also think most of us believe everyone else's life is closer to that cultural myth than ours is. But here's what I came up with to help us come to terms with the reality of finding our calling. First, as per the first half of the sermon, live your life with meaning. We discussed earlier, instead of chasing the feline of happiness, selflessly helping others is a good way to accomplish this. There are a gazillion ways to do this at any stage of your life or in any profession. Discover something that you can do now that benefits others and brings joy to your heart. As you're doing this, what we think of as a calling or purpose may present itself. Probably in an undramatic fashion, I'm sorry to say. As I said, for some it comes early and their life builds on that one thing. For others, different things present themselves throughout their lives. Different purposes, different ways to fulfill the good they can do for others. I read that in ancient Rome there was no word for vocation. Instead, they had what was called a magnum opus, a body of work. A calling was understood to be your entire life. For others of us, our lives have been a preparation for a calling later in life. I believe, for instance, in retrospect, I have been preparing for this point in my life all my life. The events of my life had somewhat surprisingly, provided the lessons I needed to consider a long dormant call to ministry. I had been acquiring skills I needed for that career change, skills I did not possess right out of high school. I needed to be patient. But I believe even if we have answered our calling, even if we are living a life of meaning, because we're human, we often don't stop wondering if we're doing the right thing. We second guess ourselves. It's not true that finding our purpose means we'll love what we're doing so much there will never be problems and we'll enjoy every minute of it. Perhaps you read Mother Teresa, who is at this point an actual saint, struggled to feel the presence of God in her life and she questioned her faith. I would be hard-pressed to think of someone who more 
clearly answered her call and was living a life of meaningful purpose. So, I understand why we in this room, and I can only speak for myself, but I'm not a saint, I can understand why we in this room would question if we're doing the right thing or living how we're called to live. That's what we as human beings are prone to do. Now, some of you ask it this way. Am I fulfilling God's will for my life? The Apostle Paul, in a letter to the Romans, told them that the commandments are summed up with this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Buddha said, as a mother would protect her only child with her life, cultivate a boundless love toward all beings. And if we look in the Hebrew Bible, in Isaiah 58, we read, this is the kind of fast day I'm after to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. So if you're working hard on these rather concise instructions, I'm sure that whatever your perception of God is will be well pleased. Here's another added suggestion that may help. Reflect. If you're so busy that you don't pause and think about what you're doing and why, meaning and purpose may be possible or even imminent and you won't realize it. That's a good reason to pray, meditate, walk, have some sort of spiritual practice so you can listen for the answers to the questions you're asking. It's also a good reason to be here each week, taking time to think about these big questions while having the support of this community. And being here opens our eyes to ways to serve others. The pursuit of meaning is what makes human beings uniquely human. We sit up and look around and ask politely, what is the purpose of all this? To use our highest strengths and talents to belong to and serve something we believe is larger than ourselves. And how do we do this? By today and every day, doing something that benefits others and brings joy to your heart. What shape is the seed in you that will grow and spread its branches against a future sky. We're excited to find out. Amen.